Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number 7, it says, So I prophesied as I command as mm, I prophesied as I had been commanded. I prophesied as I had been commanded. Just tell your neighbor, say, I'm going to say what he says. Whatever Jesus says, that's what I'm going to say. I, I prophesied just like I'd been commanded. And while I was prophesying, notice. While I was prophesying, while I was saying what he had said, there was a noise. That word noise in the Hebrew language is translated background music. <laughs> Have you ever saw, you know, Jaws and Jaws is fixing to hit the boat and it's like, da na da na da na 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 Well, as Ezekiel prophesied, there was some theatrical noise, which was music in the background, and the devil heard, dun -dun, dun -dun. the devil heard, uh-oh, I'm about to get ate up by this word. I come to tell you this morning and prophesy into your heart, the word of the Lord that is in your mouth is going to be just like, it's going to put fear in the enemy, just like Jaws put fear in the people of those who were on the ship. The word of the Lord in your mouth is going to swallow up the enemy. <laughs> So there was this background noise, this background music, and then the rattling sound. And the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked and tendons appeared on them. Flesh grew, skin covered them, but there was still no breath. Verse number 9. He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. This is what the Lord says. Breath. Come from the four winds and breathe into these who are slain that they may live. You're going to live like you have never lived before. The abundant life that Jesus paid the full price for you to have. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood on their feet just like you. A vast army. Father, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for hovering and breathing and brooding over us in this time right now. Strengthening us. Causing the bones to come together and the connections to be jointly fit together. And the strength that you are causing your bride to walk into in this season. And Lord, we just thank you for your word. And I pray that you would do this morning in your presence what could never be done outside of your presence. We thank you for what you're doing here today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. So in Ezekiel 37, we read of this encounter in the realm of the spirit that Ezekiel was taken into. And in this encounter, uh, Ezekiel had, it says, the hand of the Lord carried him and empowered him in this realm of the spirit to see these uh, dry bones. Last week, we talked about how the bones often represent, number one, the promises of God. All through Scripture, you see bones are connected with the promises. The bones are connected with promises. Bones also represent foundation. It also represents structure. The enemy wants to make sure that there is no structure in your life. Did y'all see how low the amens got? See, because most of the time we push against structure, but there is, when there is a divine and godly structure that begins to come together, God can put power on the structure of the divine. As we go into this, we see that Ezekiel was carried into this valley, and this valley uh, what is a valley? What is a valley? If you see a, a valley, you've got a, you have to have a mountain on one side and a mountain on the other for there to be a valley in the middle. So what is a valley? A valley is just a large rut. What is a rut? 
A rut is just, <laughs> anybody ever go four-wheeling? We used to go four-wheeling and we got stuck a lot. I think it was because I had a Ford at the time. I don't know. <laughs> we, 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 I, knew, I knew something would happen right there when I started talking about the Ford. Okay, I'll, I'll repent. I will not say nothing bad. About it. And we would go four-wheeling. Maybe it was the driver. It was probably the driver. And uh, when we go through mud, a lot of times uh, if, you, if, you, if, if, if enough vehicles went through a certain path of tracks for uh, an extended amount of time, a rut would be created, and eventually the rut would get deep enough to where somebody's going to get stuck in it. And so, so a rut is simply a grave that has both ends knocked out of it. So a lot of times we get stuck in something that we should have walked through. And there are areas in our life where we can testify that we are on mountaintop experiences, but as multifaceted is, as our lives are, we, so there are some areas that we are on mountaintops, and there are some, if we just be honest, there'd be some areas where we would say there are some areas, though, that I am stuck in a rut in. And I want to talk to some people who feel like that they're stuck in a rut. And, and, and all of us have areas that where we get stuck in. And God has never intended for you to get stuck in something that he intended for you to go through. You're not intended to get stuck. You're intended to go through. So look to your neighbor and say, I'm going through. Going through all the way. Where's the shovel? Oh, <laughs> where's the shovel? Yeah, yeah. So, so the Lord began to show him what these bones, who these bones represented. The bones represented the whole house of Israel or all of God's people. And they were in this valley. They were, they were dry. They were dead. Uh, Joel chapter number 3 verse number 14 says it like this, that there's multitudes in the valley of decision. And what you decide in the valley, what you decide in the rut is going to determine if you get stuck or if you are going through. Some of you just need to make a decision, I'm not going to get stuck in the rut, I'm going to go through all the way. All the way. And so as we look into this, I was talking with uh, one of my pastor friends yesterday, uh, Pastor Craig, who we're going to his church tonight. And uh, he began to release a word that the Holy Spirit was speaking to him. And I said, well, I'm going to use that too. Uh, and, and the word was, God's not looking for drive-by prophets. He's not looking for drive-by Christians. He's not looking for drive-by believers. But he's looking for people who will release his word and who will stay committed to that word and those who are assigned to that until it comes to pass. Because a lot of times we just want to give somebody a word and then we want to shoot out the door and then they never see us again. Oh, I got a word from you. The word of the Lord came to me. Here's that word. And then you never follow up. You never check in. He's not looking for drive-by prophets. He's looking for people who will follow and stay committed to that word until they see it come to pass. And often we hear that this story, and it sounds really good, uh, that we're supposed to seek the face of God, not to seek his hand. But I can't find one place in the scripture where the Lord rebuked anybody for seeking his hand. Can't find one place. His face represents fellowship, but his hand represents the ability to do. Watch this. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me. 
Number one that we want to see this morning is that the hand, it's the hand of the Lord that empowers us for service. Yes, relationship is his face and we have to have that face-to-face -face encounters. When we look in the Old Testament, every time you see the word translated in English, the English word presence, in the Hebrew language, the original Hebrew language, there is no word for presence. It's, it's face. So every time you see the word presence, when it says the presence of the Lord, it's actually in the Hebrew language, it is the face of the Lord. So that face-to-face -face fellowship is what he has intended for each one of us. God wants to have face. I feel the Holy Ghost on this. He wants to have face-to-face -face fellowship with you so that you will know that you have a face-to-face -face encounter with him. But, but it's the face that gives us fellowship and relationship but it's the hand that empowers us for service wouldn't it be a tragedy to to know what you're supposed to do but not have the power to do it that's where the face and the hand begin to work together in our lives. The hand of the Lord is empowering you for service. The question is, is can we discern the kairos moment, the divine opportunity that the Lord has given us? Luke 19 and 44, Jesus said it like this. He said, he told the people of Jerusalem, he said, you're going to miss it because you didn't discern the hour of your visitation. See, often... Opportunity does not look like opportunity. Opportunity always comes in seed form. And often, did, do you think David understood that Goliath was going to be his gateway to the throne? He saw a giant out there and he said, I can't allow him to talk about my God and my people this way. He's got to go down. He don't have a covenant with God. I got a covenant with God. I believe that we are entering into this season, into this time, where there's going to be a greater awareness of the holiness of God and the fear of God than we have ever seen in our lifetime. The holiness and the fear. Now when I'm talking about the fear of the Lord, I'm not talking about the terror and the dread like we see with Adam and Eve when they sinned and they fled away. But I'm talking about a fear of the Lord which is a respect, an awe, a reverence because there is such an awareness of His holiness. We see, we see in the book of Acts... We, we see Ananias and Sapphira, they thought it was okay to lie in the house of the Lord. They thought it was okay to lie and to, and to, and to walk in deception until they both fell dead. What if we enter into a time which I believe that we are on the verge, on the threshold of entering into, uh, that the awareness of the holiness of God is going to be so intense uh, that uh, you, mm, I got to watch what I'm saying right here because I'm telling you that, that, his, that his holiness, that his presence is going to be so intense, uh, there's not going to be things that that you used to get away with, that you'll be able to continue to get away with. Let's say it like that. So the hand of the Lord was upon me. We think about this next move of God and we think about salvations and we think about miracles and we think about the signs and the wonders. But what if this next move of God does not start with salvation? What if it doesn't start with signs, wonders, and miracles? What if it starts with a greater awareness of the holiness and the reverence and the awe and wonder of God that leads to such an intensity that there are miracles, signs, and wonders, uh, and there are salvations, uh, but it starts with an awareness of how holy and how awesome and how wonderful He is. So number two, 
The quest always begins with a question. We've heard many times from many different people, don't question God. I'm going to be one of those people who tell you it's okay to ask God questions. It's okay to ask Him questions, and it's okay for us to ask each other questions. You see, the quest, there is always a quest in every question. In the four Gospels, Jesus asked 300, I've counted them up, 307 questions. Jesus asked 307 questions in the four Gospels, and he gave an answer to three of those 307 questions. (laughs) Now, isn't that just like Jesus? There's always way more questions than there are answers. And you may be feeling discouraged this morning because you feel like you have way more questions uh, than you have answers. You're in good company. (laughs) You're in good company. See, this is worth writing down right here. Here's here's this this one statement is worth the price of admission right here. (laughs) And there was no price, so there's a difference between learning about Jesus and learning from Jesus. And often, often we're familiar of learning about him, but I think he wants to take us from learning about him to learning from him. And in Ezekiel chapter number 37, verse number 3, God asked Ezekiel a question. And he says, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And it wasn't that God did not know the answer to the question. Because every time he asks a question, it's not because he don't know the answer. He's asking to get us in alignment to begin to launch an adventure in a quest that is encapsulated in the question. And so the Lord says, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel's response was so clear. He says, well, God, you know. That should be our answer. Take it from Ezekiel. When God asks you a question, don't try to come up with an answer. Just try to say, okay, you know what the answer to this is. And so what are you trying to lead me into? (laughs) What are you setting me up for right here? You know. Out of the 307 questions that Jesus asked in the four Gospels, three of these questions are repeated more than any others. And the three most prevalent questions that Jesus asked was, number one, what are you looking for? If Jesus was standing before you right now and he asked you this question, what are you looking for, what would your response be? He said, what are you looking for? The second most popular question that Jesus asked was, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? If he was standing before you and says, okay, what do you want me to do? What would your response be? The third question was, most repeated question was, do you love me? What if we took the three most popular questions that Jesus asked people in the four Gospels, what are you looking for? What do you want me to do? And do you love me? And we meditated on those three questions until we could articulate, until we could write down and we could vocalize and answer those three questions in about three sentences or less. What are you looking for? What do you want me to do? And do you love me? See, it's the glory of God, Proverbs 25 and verse number 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it's the glory of a king. You are a king. It's the glory of a king to search out the matter. What question is he asking you right now? What question are you asking him right now? I'll give you a a, a little hint here. Don't ask him the why question. That's one of those questions that he's not going to speak a whole lot on because most of the why questions come from a place of a victim's mentality and he refuses to see you as a victim and that's why he's not answering the why question. 
So we got to go on to the questions that he is responding to. And we see here in Ezekiel chapter number 37, this quest started with the question, can these bones live again? Only you know, Lord. And then the Lord begin him begin to give him specific instructions on what to do next. He said, I need you to speak to the four winds. I need you to speak to the bones. If the bones represent the promises, if the bones represent the foundation, if the bones represent the structure, if the bones represent what is left over of what used to be, and he's saying, I need you to speak to the bones, I wonder if he's still telling us today, Michael, Linda, Heather, Bruce, whoever's in there, speak to the promises. You see, because that leads us to number three. Every time you speak, you should expect supernatural results. Every time you speak, don't say anything that you don't want to come to pass. This car is always breaking down on me. Nobody appreciates me. Nobody see. Now, now stop that mess. Quit talking like a victim. You talk like a victim and you're going to attack, uh, attract vultures. And many are attracting vultures because of the way that they're talking. Every way that you talk, you are talking, you are either attracting the angelic or you're attracting the demonic. Which do you want to attract? When you speak, expect supernatural results because words give legal access to the spirit realm to become involved with the natural realm. That's why God told Ezekiel, I need you to say this. I need you to speak to the bones because when Ezekiel, the man of God on the earth, started saying what God was saying... It gave God legal access to come on the earth and to operate on behalf of the man of God. In Genesis chapter number 1, God gave man dominion and authority over all of the earth. Somebody said, well, God can just do whatever he wants to. Well, I can show you a lot of things that God can't do because he won't violate his own commandments and he won't violate his own word. So when he gave man legal authority over the earth, he says, I can't get involved unless I have a man, unless I have a woman who will come in agreement with me and say what I'm saying on the earth. Then I have legal access to get involved. Why do you think that the, that the serpent came to Eve in the garden and said what he said to Eve because he wanted her to come into agreement with what he wanted to release on the earth and the very moment she came into agreement with what he wanted to release on the earth the enemy gained access to the natural realm that he never had before and often we give the enemy access to our lives that he shouldn't have access to because the words that we're saying are not in alignment with what heaven is saying. So when Ezekiel spoke what God had said, God then could get involved with what he was saying on the earth. But that leads us to number four. So life always flows from the convergence of the four winds, the connecting of the four winds. He said in verse number 9 of Ezekiel 37, prophesy to the four winds, to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And when there was a convergence of the four winds, when the four winds came together, life was a byproduct. When our words on all four fronts of our life come into agreement, then that word can come to pass in our lives. 
We can't say one thing in agreement with God at church and then be in opposition with what we had just confessed when we get in the parking lot and we get at home. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. If you have to say any more from that, don't. (laughs) That's the Michael Watkins translation. So the life flows, life flows. So here are all of these bones representing all of these promises. The Lord caught Ezekiel up in the realm of the Spirit to see what was going on. And before the bones could come together, there was a convergence of the four winds. There was a convergence of the invisible before there was a convergence or a coming together of the bones in the visible realm. So when we begin to, what does that translate to? When we begin to speak in the realm of the spirit, we, do you, you understand that these words are spirit and they are life. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, my word is spirit and my word is life. When you say what Jesus has said and what he is saying, you are speaking in the realm of the spirit. So there's a convergence of the invisible before there's the coming together of the bones. But then when the bones begin to come together, and that's why we look around and we see more and more people in the house of the Lord. We see more and more people coming together. What we are seeing is more and more churches come together, working together. We've got about eight churches in our network right now that are coming together. Prophetic, apostolic churches coming together, coming together, working together. This is a representation of the bones the promises of God which is the prayer of Jesus that he would be, that we would be one just like he is one because it's the will of our father for us to be one one with the Lord Jesus as the Lord Jesus is one with our father so there is a convergence a coming together of the bones but let me prophetically declare what is about to take place the bones come together that's the first phase but then the tendons begin to connect the bones. That represents flexibility between us. Because in the years past, uh, you know this is true as I'm standing here telling you, we have been very unflexible dealing with other people who don't believe just like we believe. But you see, the Lord wants to get us to a place to where we ask this question, what difference of theology is worth us parting ways over if we can agree that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God he was born of a virgin he came and lived a spotless sinless life on this earth he was crucified he was buried he was resurrected on the third day he got up he's sitting right now at the right hand of the father and he's coming back again We know that's a fact, right? We can all agree on that right there. What if we put Jesus at the center of our focus instead of all of these other ideas and all of these other theologies that separate us and we put Jesus at the center and say, Jesus Christ is Lord over all. And it don't matter if you speak in tongues and you don't speak in tongues. And it don't matter if you believe in a miracle and you don't believe in a miracle. Let's focus on what we do believe on. Jesus is Lord and he's coming back again. And he's Lord over all the church. He's Lord of all. He's Lord of all. I like doing prophetic worship. I don't like doing prophetic worship. I want to do the old hymns. I don't like the old hymns. I want to do something new. Why don't we put all of that together and we didn't rally around the type of music that we like or the type of ministry that we like, but we rallied around the resurrected Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, because He's Lord over all. Life always flows from the convergence when there is unity, when there is a coming together. 
So the bones came together first. The tendons, which represent the flexibility, the ability to move. Although we're still connected together, we still have the ability to flow and move. After that took place, then the muscles came. The muscles represent the strength, the power, the ability to get done what daddy wants done. And that's why the enemy is so afraid of the body of Christ truly coming together and functioning as one because he knows that when we do come together and rally around Jesus Christ uh, that uh, there is going to be strength that comes on the body that this world has never seen. The things that you read about in the book of Acts are going to be nothing compared uh, to what God wants to do uh, in this last day generation. Uh, he said, I will pour out my spirit on all things flesh on your sons and your daughters. I don't believe that women should preach. I don't believe that, I don't believe that if you've been married before you should preach. I don't believe. I, let's, let's stop talking about what we don't believe about uh, and start talking about what we do believe about that Jesus is at the center. Jesus is at the center. Jesus is at the center. Life Always, number four, life always flows from the convergence when we begin to work together, fitly jointed together. Fitly jointed together. Well, I don't like that song that y'all sing. I'm going. <laughs> well, I didn't I didn't ever I didn't ever I didn't ever think the song was about you liking it or you not liking it. I thought we were singing unto God. Instead of looking at what divides us and separates us, we focus on what brings us together. And that is the resurrected, spotless Son of God, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And He's the one at the center of it all. Life flows from the convergence. He said, prophesy to the four winds, prophesy to the north. Prophesy to the south, prophesy to the east, prophesy to the west. I think it's interesting that life flowed from this convergence of the four winds as he prophesied to the wind. He's, you know, all through the Bible you see that God tells you to speak to stuff. He says, speak to your mountain and it'll be moved. Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves, and they stopped. Jesus said, if you would speak to the tree, it would be uprooted. He said, if you spoke to the mountain. He's always telling us to speak to inanimate objects. So that tells me that our problem, it has ears. Our mountain has ears. The tree that's standing in the way has ears. The storm has ears. And what are you speaking into the ears of those mountains, those trees, those storms, are you empowering them, giving them legal access to continue doing what they're doing? Uh, or are you empowering the angelic realm for the kingdom of God to come, the will of God to be done on earth just like it is in heaven? Who are you giving access to? Life flows from the convergence. We see the four faces of God. The face of the lion, the face of the eagle, the face of the ox, the face of man. There were four rivers of supply in the Garden of Eden. And when all of those four came together, there was a convergence. I'm here to lay something on you. We know that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? But watch this, and then there's you. He's not complete without you, and you're not complete without him. You came from him. If I am in Christ, and Christ is in me, and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, where does that put me? If you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, and Christ is at the right hand of majesty, where does that put you? What if we start functioning from that reality 
that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers, far above all dominions. And too many times we give way too much credit to the devil and say, well, you just don't know the spiritual warfare that I'm facing. My tire got blowed up. My cat died. You know, the power got cut off. I got fired. I got all of this warfare coming against us. And I just want to say, uh, yeah, but greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. I am not moved and I am not impressed with what the enemy has done or what he is doing. I am so fascinated with the Lord Jesus that I refuse to be amused or amazed by what the devil has done or doing. I'm not even giving him any vocabulary time. I'm giving Jesus the words so that he can have legal access to move, to rule, to reign in my life.